on this beautiful day. Ah, well, I'm I'm sporting my Gloucester City Mission T-shirt. <laughs> so uh, we had a, a GCM quiz here last night, raising money for Gloucester City Mission, and uh, we didn't win. No, our, our team did come in the top few. Mine, we didn't do too bad, but uh, I, it was amazing. And uh, Kevin, who runs Gloucester City Mission, he was telling us that. Uh, do you know, a few years ago, the council were trying to stop us as, a, as an organization, Gloucester City Mission, from running our night shower. <laughs> they, they, they thought it would attract the wrong sort of people to Gloucester. This year, a few years on, they are asking if we can open earlier. How about that? <laughs> so Gloucester City Mission night shower is actually opening at the beginning of November this year rather than December, which is fantastic. And it will run right through till the end of March. So that's good news. Uh, so I hope you've come to hear some good news this morning. Yeah? I'm wondering why half the church are today. Where are they? In London, maybe? Do you think? In the queue. <laughs> That's amazing, that queue, isn't it? I can't stop watching it. <laughs> right. Why don't we stand together? I'm going to pray, and then we're going to start our service. Father, thank you for this beautiful new day. Thank you that we get to meet here together. Thank you that we get to meet with you. Lord, would you come and speak to us? Would you come and energize us? Would you come and fill us afresh? Lord, would you come and speak to us? Speak to our hearts. Speak to our situations. Lord, may we leave here this morning sort of more built up and full of hope and joy than when we came in. Yeah. And I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 darkest hour your name has no less power the risen christ in christ alive there's always always hope in the name of jesus in the name above all names come all that before us Come all that befalls us, you will be standing taller, the Lord of Lords, Lord over all. And come the day you return, you gather all of your church, for this behind us, for paradise there's always, always hope. again. There's always, always hope in the name of Jesus, in the name of all names. You were faithful then, you were faithful still, you have all again. You were faithful then, you were faithful still, you have always reigned and you always will. You're unshakable and in everything. There's always hope, there's always hope. of terror in a waste of war in the wake of trauma still hope endures you are still my savior in the face of terror in the waste of war in the wake of trauma 
kids to go out to all their groups now. I pray that you all have a good morning. rest of us we're going to remain in this posture of worship and we're going to worship the Lord Now it is well. I'm 
Father, thank you that we can come here this morning just as we are. Lord, whatever we're struggling with right now, or if we're on the heights, I thank you that it doesn't matter where we are, it's where you are that counts. And I thank you that you're there. I thank you that you're with us. I thank you that you are just wanting to uh, embrace us and speak to us, comfort us, and encourage us and challenge us right now. So I pray that we would have ears to hear, hearts that are open. Amen. Amen. Do have a seat, everybody. I do pray for Joseph Blake this morning. He is currently on a 10K run somewhere around Tetbury, I don't know, uh, raising money for a local charity by their school. And, of course, Rosie is booked in to have her C-section on Friday. So our latest little addition to church is arriving very shortly. So please pray that that all goes really, really well for them. Uh, okay. There's a few things happening this week. Has anybody booked up to go and play bowls this afternoon? Dave, would you like to come out and just tell everybody where it is and how to get there and all that sort of stuff? You did say you would. I know you hate coming up here, but come and... Come and, say, come and let everybody know. Oh, hi. Well, if you uh, haven't heard about it before, it's just a social afternoon, uh, as long as you want. We've got some uh, coaching. It's at Mid-Door. Sorry, it's at Mid-Gloss Indoor Bowling. We've got uh, uh, three coaches to teach us. Uh, somebody hasn't bowled for the first time, you're going to learn. Um, no, yeah, it's um, in Brockworth, off Ermin Street. Um, behind Invista. Uh, if you look on the Midgloss uh, website, you'll get the full directions or see me afterwards and I'll, I'll tell you where to go politely. Um, <laughs> but uh, no experience necessary. Uh, all you need to bring is yourselves and socks. We provide the shoes. I guess they have to be special flat shoes. And uh, if we can't get them to fit you, then you can just play in your socks. Uh, but it'll be a fun time. Uh, there is a coffee machine there if you uh, um, bring a pound coin. Uh, but we're just going to have a bit of fun. And uh, I think that's it, is it? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. If you want to come, write your name at the back, because I think they need to know names and numbers and stuff like that. 
Uh, what else? Is there anything else? Our open house every morning, every Tuesday morning, 10 o'clock. Just come and turn up. Come and have a cup of coffee. It, it's great. That's all I'm going to say on that. Uh, Celebrate Recovery is a 12-step uh, Christian church-based recovery group. Uh, we used to run it here at Kingfisher. We're not running it here at the moment, but we are running one in Stroud at the Salvation Army. I'm involved in that one. If you'd want to come, if you've got any hurt, hang-up, or habit that you're stuck with and you just don't know what to do with, it's a great, supportive place to be. Look at us now matching t-shirts. <laughs> was there anything else? I think that was it for now. Uh, okay, so have you come ready to hear God's word to you? I'm, some of you have. That's good. That's good. So, yes. Uh, so Gloucester City Mission had a quiz here last night. Yeah, yeah. There's a few more I thought you might have yours on as well this morning. <laughs> so uh, last week, we um, started a series all about invitation. I just think that didn't sound very exciting. But um, <laughs> the word invite comes from the Latin word invitari. I don't even know how to pronounce it. I just made that up. In, that is an actual word. Latin word, invitari which means to go after something, pursue with vigor, desire. So to give an invitation to someone is to show that you care about them and that you are going after their time and desiring their presence. Does that make sense? Uh, and what we're looking at here over these next few weeks is um, some invitations of Jesus, recognizing that they are not given out casually, God is pursuing us with vigor. He desires relationship with you and me, no matter who you are. So we can know we have been chosen. And the invitation is freely given. It can't be earned or bought. It just has to be received and then attended to. Okay. So listen to this from a letter sent by a man called Peter. This is from a paraphrased version of the Bible called The Message. This is a, his second letter, chapter 1, verse 3, and it says, Everything that goes into a life of pleasing God has been miraculously given to us by getting to know personally and intimately the one who invited us to God, the best invitation we ever received. So we can get to know Jesus personally and intimately. What an invitation. Pleasing God is not a matter of how well you behave or how religious you are. It's accepting his invitation. It's believing and trusting in what he has already done for you and for me. And then choosing to place our lives in his hands. Verse 10 says, so friends, confirm God's invitation to you, his choice of you. Don't put it off. Do it now. Do this and you'll have your life on a firm footing, the streets paved and the way wide open into the eternal kingdom of our master and savior, Jesus Christ. It's an invitation. You need to make a response. You need to reply to it. Do it now. That's pretty much where we finished last week, wasn't it? I'm so grateful that his, his invitation came to my attention, and I said yes, back when I was 12 years old. But I know many people who just won't trust something that says it's free. What's the catch? You ever thought that? Well, it's only free to us because Jesus has already paid the highest price with his life dying on a cross. This is the good news of Christianity, right? It's only because of Jesus living and dying and rising from the dead that the way has been opened for us into the eternal kingdom. The penalty for sin that keeps us out and separated from God, he paid on our behalf. That's how we can know we are loved and chosen and forgiven. That's how we can be restored and have the assurance of eternal life. 
That's why we can receive this invitation. Somebody say amen. We're not really a Pentecostal church, but I love a bit of Pentecostal. If you agree with something, if it gets you excited, show everybody, all right? Last time, we looked at what Jesus meant when he said, come follow me, that it's an invitation to a life of discovery. In following Jesus, we get to discover what God is like, creative, loving, compassionate, holy. In following Jesus, we get to discover who we were made to be, a masterpiece of design. You ever looked at yourself like that? You are a masterpiece of design with a God-given purpose. We get to discover the plans he had in mind for us all along. It's an adventure of faith. This is what I was saying last week. A courageous, risk-taking, exhilarating way of living as I choose to trust him, to obey him, to become more like him. If only we would take his invitation seriously and attend to it. The problem is that so much can get in the way of all of that. Don't you think? So much of what we carry in life, it it weighs us down. It slows us up. And you might be thinking, yes, I'd love that life of faith, Ollie. Sounds great. But back here in the real world, (laughs) that's not how it is. You know, I've got a mortgage or rent to pay. I've got responsibilities, and the cost of living is just getting higher. I'm trying to manage a long-term illness right now. I'm barely surviving. You don't understand the, the stress that I'm under, the worries I'm battling, the, 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 the fears that are overwhelming me. Which brings me to the second of our invitations from Jesus. And you can find this in Matthew 11, 28 to 30. Where he said this. This might sound very familiar to you, but I want you to hear it afresh. Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What an invitation. Remember, an invitation can be ignored, it can be rejected, or it can be accepted. What is your reply? What is your RSVP to that invitation? You know, nearly everyone I meet recently tells me how tired they are. Everyone put your hand up if you're feeling tired. <laughs> true. (laughs) There is such a weariness in the world right now. What is burdening you? I'm not asking you to shout it out, but just bring it to mind. It's thought that Jesus was referring here to the burden of impossible religious demands and expectations that the Pharisees were just putting on people. But what are you carrying? What else are you carrying that is weighing you down? that is tripping you up and keeping you stuck and burning you out. You know, those things might be our reality, but God did not design us to carry around any of that stuff. Fear, anxiety, depression, shame, guilt, doubt, jealousy, insecurity, hate. Bitterness, resentment, disappointment, despair, suicidality, or or anything else that assaults our mind and drives our behavior. And yet for many of us, that's life. That's how it is. And we've either never considered or have stopped believing that it can be any different. And, And some of those things don't feel like baggage, do they? They just feel like part of who we are. So how can it be any different? How can it ever change? But but Jesus says, I want to teach you. I want to show you something different. I'm inviting you. I'm inviting you to come to me. 
And I'm making you a promise that you will find rest for your soul. Now your soul is your mind and your will and your emotions. Jesus said if you come to him and learn from him, if you yoke yourself to him, if you move with him, then your life is going to change. It won't be problem free. Don't get me wrong. Jesus observed that in this world, we will have many troubles, but he also said we can take heart when we come to him. Don't, we don't lose heart. It will feel easier and lighter because of the peace and the hope and the purpose that a union with him comes with. He's the one who says he has overcome the world. And don't forget that this world is not the end of the story. This world won't last forever. There is an eternity to come. A life without evil, without suffering, without pain. What we experience in this world is short and temporary compared with what's to come. Oh, can't you? I can't wait. <laughs> so Jesus says you can take heart. Take my yoke upon you. Learn the truth. Receive the hope that comes from me when you get to know me intimately and personally. Here's what I read this week about what a yoke is. You might be thinking, what's a yoke? A yoke is a farming implement that joins two animals, such as oxen, together so that the animals can share the workload evenly and become more productive. Sometimes an older, more experienced animal is yoked with a younger, less experienced animal so that the older animal can train the younger animal while they work together. By using the illustration of a yoke, Jesus is asking us to share and be partners with him in his work, in his ministry and service. He is also telling us that he will train us. The word yoke was a technical term used in the context of teaching and obedience to scripture in Judaism. Every rabbi had their own yoke. That is their own interpretation of the Old Testament scriptures. And Jesus wants us to come to him and learn from him in a continuing relationship. He will equip us, teach us, and guide us to be effective in life and service if we are committed to him. If we come to Jesus and do things his way, in partnership and communion with him, he promises that we will find rest and refreshment for our souls. In the process, we will become more like our rabbi Jesus, gentle and humble in heart. The yoke that Jesus gives is easy because Jesus shares it with us. It's easy because it is productive and useful and not vain and futile. It is easy because it is correct and life-giving. And moreover, it is easy because it fits well. I love that. In coming to Jesus, have you yoked yourself to him? Or have you just believed in him? Just something in your head. Have you yoked yourself to him? Or are you still trying to do it all yourself in your own strength? To rest is to lie on or lean on something. Yeah? Or to put something on something else so that its weight is put something on something else so that its weight is supported. With we are left to carry it all ourselves. So no wonder so many people feel weary. But with him, we get to rest in him, to rely on him. I don't know how people do this life without Jesus. I really don't. What does it mean? What does it look like to actually come to Jesus? Well, firstly, it means choosing to accept that in his death, choosing to accept and trust in his death and resurrection. That's what it means realizing and believing that it's only God's love in action that can change what's wrong and make us right. But, but coming to Jesus is not a, a once-in-a-lifetime thing that you do. It is seen in the time that we spend with him every day. Every day in our praying to him in our seeking his will through reading his word, in beholding him and worshiping him, in obeying him. And I'm not talking about just ticking off a little to-do list here. I'm not advocating religion, but relationship. 
relationship. You know, the best marriages, the best friendships are between people who enjoy spending time together, right? Who communicate at an intimate level with each other, who do what they can to show love to each other. That's not seen as a chore or an obligation, I hope, but a desire. That's the sort of relationship Jesus is offering here. And he's given us, the church, to make it tangible. A place where we can encourage and motivate each other. A place to care for each other. A place of restoration and service. A place to partner with God in his plans. A place of rest and refuge and refueling from this weary world that we're in. You'll only benefit from that, though, as much as you are present. Should I say that to everybody at home? (laughs) We want you here. And church will only be that as much as we own that. And are committed to that, committed to each other. You know, Jesus offers that invitation to come to him. But now that he has risen and ascended into heaven, our job as his church here on the earth, his body, the Bible says, is to extend that same invitation to come, to find rest, to find relationship, to learn from Jesus. For those of us who have come to Jesus, found that rest, and have taken on his yoke, this is what he calls us to be an active part of. And that's the church that God has called me to be a pastor of. I want to tell you some of the the journey that has led me here and why I believe in the potential of our church to be the answer to that amazing invitation to come and find rest. You know, when I was 17, it's a long time ago, (laughs) a man was praying for me, and uh, he told me that God was going to put me through a long period of training for some great work he had for me in the future. I I know that sounds pretty vague, (laughs) but it's a word that I have held onto my entire life, all through my nursing career. I I always saw it as training. I never saw it as the destination. You know, I'm praying for more of us to be speaking these sort of words into each other and over each other. For those of you who don't know, I, I trained as a registered mental nurse, an RMN, back in the days of Coney Hill Hospital. If you're from Gloucester, you'll, you'll know all about Coney Hill. For many years after qualifying, I worked in Cheltenham. Becoming a pastor was never on my radar. (laughs) Not once did I think that was something I was going to do. Never crossed my mind. But then something happened in 2003 that that changed my thinking, changed my direction. At that time, I was a, a community psychiatric nurse, CPN, in a team called Assertive Outreach, which meant working with difficult to engage clients. My caseload made up of of People who had a dual diagnosis of serious mental illness and substance misuse. So these were often people with little insight into their conditions. They were not good (laughs) at complying with treatment programs. And they presented with substantial risk. One of the guys I've been working with was called Rob. He was in his 20s. He was diagnosed with schizophrenia. And he had a raging crack in heroin habit. And his life was about as chaotic as they come. Uh, During the working week, I tried to touch base with him every single day. And the aim was to to manage the risk as best we could, ensuring he was taking the medication that he was meant to be taking, (laughs) offering interventions that would manage, help him manage his symptoms, and, and supporting him to access mainstream drug services. And None of that was easy, by the way, (laughs) and progress was exceedingly slow. But, um, you know, me and Rob, we developed a real good working relationship. I liked him a lot, despite all his issues. There was a nice guy under there. We had some amazing conversations. On his part, 
he, he said to me that he had no hope. He had written himself off completely. He believed there was no help for people like him. That's sad. But that was the mindset I was trying to challenge all the time. His experience was that standard mental health services uh, didn't want to work with him because of his drug use. And the drug services couldn't engage with him because of his mental health issues. He was one of these who sort of fell through the net, which is why he was with the team that I was in. But from his perspective, you know, illicit class A drugs were the most effective way of medicating and managing his intrusive thoughts. They worked for him, you know, despite creating a whole load of other issues. <laughs> And, and if I felt overwhelmed by the problems of this young man and what he was dealing with, he, he felt a million times worse. And he believed that he was doing the best that he could, actually. I asked him what it would look like, a place where he could get the support that he needed. But he didn't believe anywhere existed that would give him a chance. And yes, we talked about faith, because he asked. <laughs> you know, as a nurse, I'm not allowed to talk about Jesus. If you work in those sort of places, you'll know. It's not, not on. And yet, as a Christian, I'm like, he's your greatest hope. He's the only hope you've got, really. But God started talking to me about a place where people could come and find hope and find recovery. Was this Something that God was calling me to do. I remember turning up to his flat one day, and um, as I went in, there were a number of other drug users in the room, and the, the air was thick with smoke, and the coffee table was covered in drug-using paraphernalia. And I made my excuses <laughs> to leave. So I'll come back later, Rob. And uh, he looked up at me, and he said, Ollie, please don't give up on me. Oh, it just kind of broke my heart. <laughs> Still does. Excuse me. This was almost 20 years ago. Look at me. I can come to the worst bit yet. Don't give up on me. And I never forgot that expression on his face. And I hope I'm known as someone who doesn't give up on people easily. In April of 2003, things had become more difficult for him. In an attempt to get away from the, the police because of acquisitive crime, he jumped over a wall and he broke his leg in a number of places. And he was admitted to hospital and his leg was in plaster right up to his thigh. He could barely move. And, and uh, he was still getting illicit drugs brought to the ward for him. And when the ward found out, they discharged him. Of course they would. They discharged him to a, it was a first floor, a ground floor respite flat. That's where he was. And I was seeing him every day and taking him to appointments. And around this time, he started hanging about with an acquaintance of his called Mark, who had an alcohol problem. And my last memory of Rob is dropping him and Mark and him struggling with his crutches <laughs> and agreeing to see me the next morning for his hospital appointment and waving me off. The next morning, he was my first house call. It was a beautiful, sunny April day. I knocked on his downstairs window, as I always did, but no reply. So I rang the bell at the front of the block of flats he was in, still nothing. Just as I was about to leave, the buzzer went letting me through. So I went in, went and knocked on his front door, but it, it wasn't Rob that answered the door, it was Mark. I couldn't understand him as he stood swaying there in the doorway. He was so drunk he could barely stand. He was blocking my way in, so I started calling Rob's name. Where, Rob, where are you? And I was saying to him, where's Rob? And it was then that he, he opened his arms to reveal these blood-stained sleeves. And I'd suddenly caught what he was saying, and he said, I've killed him. And very tragically, he had. 
over some stupid argument. And that day changed me. I think traumatic events can paralyze you or they can propel you. And I remember when we eventually had a case review and I was asked how I was in the aftermath, stating it just made me want to make a better difference for other people like Rob. It's actually what led me to studying for a degree in substance misuse when I felt like I wasn't academically capable. <laughs> It's what compelled me to specialize in drug and alcohol treatment. It's what drew me to the work of Gloucester City Mission and getting involved with Celebrate Recovery. But ultimately, it's what led me to being your pastor here. I know that I couldn't have done any of those things without coming to Jesus, without being part of his church. I was carrying all sorts of fears and anxieties that could have stopped me pursuing the life that God had for me. And I am living proof that the power of God can give you rest and can bring about change. He gave me a yoke that fits me perfectly. And I'm a massive champion of being part of the local church. Are you? Back in 2003, after Rob's death, I thought my destiny was to see a Christian rehab home established here in Gloucester, a place of safety, a place of transformation where people could lay down their heavy burdens and find real rest, real relationship with Jesus, discover who they really were and what they are here for. That idea of seeing a, a drug rehab home established is not come to pass yet. I don't know if it ever will. But what I have come to realize more and more, especially over the last 10 years, is that God wants me to pastor a church like that. I mean, that has been the stated mission of our church since we started in 1993, to reach lost people and to see them transformed into fully devoted followers of Jesus Christ. We might not be a 24-7 rehab facility here, but we can be a place that offers the welcome home, right? When people feel like there's nowhere else for them to go. Where people who can come who are weary and burdened and can have the weight lifted. Where they can encounter Jesus, realize their true worth, embark on a journey of recovery within a safe and supportive community. We don't know how blessed we are to have that with the hope of restoration and a life that has purpose. Isn't that what the body of Christ is meant to be doing? You know, Kingfisher Treadworth is not just a service here on a Sunday morning. We are a growing community of believers representing Jesus, offering that same invitation to come to him to find rest in him, to start relationship, and to engage in his kingdom work. Do you want to be part of that? Glad some of you do. <laughs> Recently, I, vi I visited a Christian rehab up in Loughborough near Leicester. Two guys who had been staying at Gloucester City Mission in the night shelter last winter, they were asking for help. And they, came to, they came here to church. One I've known for a long time, one was new to me, and we referred them to this place called the Carpenter's Arms. Don't you love that name? The Carpenter's Arms, that place of resting in the arms of Jesus. Both of them have now completed phase two of that program. They've been there since May. Both of them have had Holy Spirit encounters. Both of them have found rest and are now believing that God has a good plan for their lives. Don't tell me that God doesn't keep his promises. Don't tell me that he, he doesn't still change lives. But it requires us answering his invitation and attending to it. Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. You know, that day in April 2003, 
is always a reminder to me of Jesus with his blood-stained arms outstretched. He's the one who didn't take a life. He, he's the one who gave his life. His arms stretched out on that cross for people just like Rob and Mark. For people just like me and you. Saying, I'm doing this for you. That's what Jesus was saying. So come to me. When he was on that cross, that's what he was saying. Come to me. Find forgiveness in me. Find healing in me. Find recovery in me. Find purpose in me. Find peace in me. Find love in me. Find truth in me. Find meaning in me. Find rest in me. Find a way through me that leads to life. That's what Jesus offers, and we get to be part of offering that as well. It starts at the cross where our burdens were dealt with once and for all. But then we visit the empty tomb, that place of new life, new beginnings, new possibilities with the risen Jesus by our side, yoked to him. Will you come to him this morning? Whether that's for the first time or coming back to him again. Will you respond to his invitation, not just to find some help, but to put on a new yoke? Will you come and be part of what Jesus wants to do through this church here in Treadworth as we seek to increasingly become that place of rest and recovery? If you do, I'd like you to pray. I think the band can come up and get, get yourselves ready. Is there anybody who wants to come up and pray this morning? I'm feeling all worn out. <laughs> Anybody want to come and pray? Thank you, Lisa. Come and pray for us. Why don't we all stand? Father God, I thank you for your steadfastness, for your message through Ollie this morning. I thank you that in every bit of life you are with us, no matter what low we're in, no matter how far we think we've fallen, no matter what's been taken from us or what we've lost, you are with us. And to be in you is to gain. I thank you, Lord, that every step we take yoked to you is gain in this life. And Lord, I pray for everyone present this morning. Whatever's holding them back, be it fear, loss of hope, anger, resentment, worry, shame, whatever it is, Lord, I pray that you would lift that off each one of us. Lift our eyes to you. Let us get into your presence, Lord, and start again. Wherever we're at right now, Lord, we ask that we can step into your presence and enter into life with you, yoke with you, the excitement of sharing with you. We ask this in the mighty name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Yeah, let's make a response to that church. Then 
every breath that I am made I will sing of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire. In darkest nights, you are close like no other. I've known you as a father, I've known you as a friend, oh, I have lived in the goodness of God. And all my life you have been faithful, and all my life you have been so of the goodness of God. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now, I give you Life laid down, I'm surrendered now. I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Cause all my life you have been the goodness of God. Oh, I'm gonna sing of the goodness of God. Hi, I just wanted to um, tell everyone that those words are just so, so true. And I became a Christian in 1981, so I've been a Christian a long time. But even, and I've known the goodness of God, I've known miracles, we've seen a lot of things Dave and I as we served. But seven weeks ago, I fell, and I hurt myself really badly. And it was an uphill battle to get seen by anyone. And when I did, um, and eventually had to go and have a scan privately, um, I was fine with that and then I'm seeing a guy on the 28th. However, I went last Thursday for this scan after struggling for six or seven weeks and um, I got a phone call on the Friday to say I've got to go back. And what I'm saying is, even as a, a long-standing Christ Christian who's trusted God in lots of different ways, I fell apart. I absolutely fell apart. And Dave said to me, love is the opposite to fear and we don't walk in fear and I know that but the thought of having a new hip again after only 12 months or having a back operation with a damaged back was just beyond what I could cope with however Rachel sent me this, te this text with a song on it and the, per the words were just like what we've sung today and what we've heard Ollie speak about. 
how we can trust in God because he's with us all the time we're in his hands and he knows us inside out so even if I have to have those things done if the outcome is is not as good as what I might hope or God might intervene and I might have a miracle because I believe in them um, I don't have to fear because I know and I can trust how faithful the Lord is and then on another thing after three years of being estranged from my daughter yesterday we spent a day with her and the family and it's just like it's just like God's goodness poured over us when we've had one bit of bad news and then that happens and I just realized that the chain has broken that she made because we've never fallen out but she's made and I know there's so many people whose families are estranged from them or grandchildren but God is a God of love and he's a God of restoration and he's a God of miracles and he can do them in each and every one of us pray for you Would you pray Father thank you for that testimony Lord thank you that we don't know what's going to happen to us from one day to the next really but Lord I thank you that you do thank you that as we hold on to you you're the one who gets us through I just pray for Bev right now. Thank you, Lord, for just the restoration of that relationship with her daughter. But Lord, I just pray that you will lift off her any fear which is just trying to take root in her heart right now. Lord, I pray that instead it will be replaced with that confident trust in you. And yes, Lord, we pray for Bev's healing. We pray, Lord, that she won't have to go through any more operations. We pray for that miracle that we know you can do. Lord, we choose to trust you anyway, but whatever happens, Lord, I pray that that fear would go in Jesus' name. Lord, Bev, that you would know the love of God filling you afresh. Amen. Amen. Gosh, if anybody else needs prayer this morning, I know everybody, so many people have come with burdens. And um, hey, we've got two more t shirts. <laughs> oh, if anybody wants some prayer. If you've come to church and you're feeling really burdened, please don't walk out of that door feeling the same way as you came in. Please ask somebody you know to pray for you. Come and talk to me and I'll pray for you. Um, let's do that before we finish this morning. Uh, but otherwise, um, feel free to go and get yourself some refreshment. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, it's good to be in this place, isn't it? On a Sunday morning. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you.